How many matches are played in an FRC season? We all have our favorite matches of the year. Some that go smoothly, some where our robot works for the first time, and some that are just fun to watch. In 2010, 5,567 official matches were played, under a third of the amount of official matches played in 2025. 15 years ago, the highest scoring match of the season would be played as one of the most memorable and impactful matches in FRC history. On this episode of Rewind, we're diving in to analyze Qual Match 100 on the Curie Division in 2010, examining the strategic choices made and the impact of the controversy that followed. Coming up on Rewind. This video on fun is brought to you by our viewers, supporters, members, and also in partnership with the following. Animark provides superior service with the reliability that teams expect. Check out their sport gearbox and ratchet sport options through their tried and true compliant wheels used by teams all over the world. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to animark.com for your one-stop shop of high quality and affordable solutions. Kettering University's cutting-edge programs and their experiential co-op model seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds, offering hands-on, feature-focused learning that empowers students to pursue new ideas and inspires other institutions to follow their lead. Don't just be ahead of the curve, create the curve. Get more information at kettering.edu slash first. The 2010 game, Breakaway, was the start of an era of FRC games that focused on sports, pulling real-life excitement into the world of robotics. It was the time when FRC solidified rules, worked around loopholes, and truly became the program that we know today. The 2010 game was still working through some of these features, but gathering the knowledge from past complaints delivered a game that was held in high regard at the time. One of the areas that was more experimental was the ranking system. In 2009, rankings were based on three sorts. Your qualifying score, which was a normal two points per win, one for a tie, zero for a loss, most points, your highest scoring match, and ranking score. Ranking score was the second order sort designed to balance strength of schedule. If you were on the winning alliance, you got the losing alliance's score before penalties. If you were on the losing alliance, you got your score after penalties. With the first order sort of qualifying score, ranking score became more applicable at higher levels, where the score broke many ties Result resulting in volatile rankings that often didn't reflect the best robots at the competition. 2010 rankings took inspiration from the 2009 ranking scores, trying to balance strength of schedule with the strength of the team. Qualifying scores were completely erased and replaced with seeding points and cooperation bonuses. In 2010, the winning alliance received the score of the winning alliance plus five additional points as their seeding points. The losing alliance also received the score of the winning alliance, but without the five point bonus. Added on to your base seeding point was the cooperation bonus. Teams on the winning alliance received seeding points equal to twice the unpenalized score of the losing alliance. In case of a tie, all teams received the co-op bonus. The losing alliance received zero points. The co-op score was also tallied separately and served as the second order sort when necessary. Without a win-loss-tie ranking system, it became better to win by a lot, tie, or lose by a large margin with your score at zero. Rankings and match play capitalized on this at higher levels, but stayed relatively the same at regional and district level. In the lead-up to this match, many teams had begun purposefully playing matches to lose to rank higher, helping their opponents score so that their seeding points would increase. In response, the winning team would begin to score for their opponents in order to increase their co-op score. This resulted in a confusing, confusing evolution of the meta at higher levels. Curie Division Qual Match 100 was a battle between three of the top four teams in the division, with help on both sides. The Red Alliance was an absolute powerhouse, with teams 111 and 888 feeding the infamous meta-breaking 469 machine. 469's robot did substantially better in matches where they could be fed by other teams, recycling goals that they made. 111 was a top 50 worldwide robot in terms of shooting, and 888 was a great feeder to complement this alliance. It was an Einstein caliber grouping. The Blue Alliance featured teams 288, 231, and 1114, all teams with great shooting capabilities. 1114 was far and away the team to beat in the division, with the highest OPR and great cross-field play. This matchup was the deciding factor in who would take the number one seed in the division. It was also one of the most high-powered qualification matches scheduled in the entire championship event, 
and to quote the Chief Delphi thread after, the dome tilted a little northwest during that match. With that in mind, let's head over to the match. Welcome to Curie Qualification Match 100. It's the year 2010, the game is Breakaway, and we're here to break down one of the greatest matches that ever happened. Already in the autonomous period, you can see that robots are not in the position that they're supposed to be in. Also in this first shot, you can see that the dome is tilting towards the audience here. The stands are filled and the, the area by the field is completely packed. This match was a match to watch. In auto though, we could tell that something was up. You know, in 2010, you had three robots, one that could start in each zone. Team 1114 was sort of your power scorer here in the autonomous period, but they're going to start in their opponent's zone here. They're actually a little bit further away from the camera than we'd expect them to be, but that's all right. It's 2010, we don't expect good video quality. So they're starting in the opponent's zone. This was not normal for them. Usually they would start in the close zone or the mid zone. They were one of the best mid zone scorers in 2010. So they're starting over there. 288 is starting in the middle zone. And we're going to see red sort of prepare for the match and blue sort of sit there in this autonomous period. They've clearly got a strategy. We'll see how it plays out for them. Red is going to set up their offensive powerhouse here with 469 approaching where they're going to take the stands uh, and be able to score that amount of points. So we're getting set up uh, and then the tele-operated period is going to start. Ding, ding, ding. We are off and running. So 288 immediately goes and they're going to park in their own zone uh, after sort of feeding all the balls to one side of the field. Uh, you see that they're helping out sort of in that mid zone there, um, as the red teams are also putting things in there. One of the red teams has obviously been tasked with playing defense on 11-14, and they are doing it. Uh, team 888, one of the greatest defense robots on the field, is chasing around 11-14 because they don't know exactly what Blue is doing here. Another thing that I'll point out is that you can see for a little bit there, as 1114 just scrolled past, that the blue team and their alliance partners are now setting up to park in these zones. They're setting up to park there. The other team is also parked sort of in that other zone there. They are making sure that their score is going to sit at zero for the entire match. It's very important that they go and they block those goals almost immediately, because if the Blue Alliance gets even one point, they miss out on that cooperation bonus. 11-14 is going to continue playing the mid zone, as they are one of the best mid zone scorers. They're going to shoot from the middle and score in the red goal. They are quite successful at doing this, and they'll continue to do this as 888 tries to prevent them from scoring more. <laughs> At this point, Red is kind of keyed into what the strategy might be, um, and Team 469 and 111 are both trying to run up that score as much as possible. 1114 is going to traverse the bumps on the field a little bit more, try to get in some short passes as we can see that both of these blue goals are completely blocked off by both of these teams. We also see at this point that this entire section of the field these entire two-thirds are completely devoid of balls from scoring. This means that 469 has really gotten into that flow of cycling that 1114 is feeding them and 111 is feeding them. And we'll see how this match continues to play out. 1114 does kind of get caught in a pin here by 888, just because of how the match was playing out and 888 was still playing defense on them. Um, and towards the end of the match, we'll see scoring kind of slow down um, as 469 uh, gets into the rhythm and 11-14 keeps popping them in. Um, but then it's going to kind of uh, jam up a little bit near the end, uh, just because of how the bumps on the field ended up working. By this time, the Red Alliance knows what's going on. Um, Blue Alliance is kind of in their zone, they don't have much that's going on, um, but this match was all about scoring, and that's what every single team on this field is doing right now. Um, of 111, really putting on a showcase of uh, how to work with 469, how to make sure that 
they are uh, sort of free to have one goal and they score in the other. Um, and then that is the end of the match. Um, that is the most amount of points that would be scored in a single breakaway game. And it was done uh, collaboratively through both alliances. Now we'll head into sort of what happened after this match, after this great display of scoring and sort of the interesting things that happened because of what happened to the rankings here. As one of the most visible and highest scoring matches of the season, this match was very controversial. Although many teams employed this strategy to rank high, it seemed antithetical to boost the score of your opponent in order to do better in the competition, and this strategy was difficult to understand. However, it was a fair way to play the game based on the written rules, despite the confusion. 11-14 locked down the number one seed from this match, but never discussed the strategy with the other alliance. The game was not exactly designed to play this way. Woody Flowers is quoted saying 6v0 was not an intended outcome from this game design, but many teams found that this was a consistent way to benefit from matches where they knew they were going to lose, in a ranking system that did not reward just the win, loss, or tie. Looking at the data for this matchup of Titans, there were four expected outcomes of this match. The first, a tie. This would be very difficult to control and difficult to guarantee with both teams playing for the win. The second outcome, a close, high-scoring match would be bad for the losing team, missing out on the five-point bonus and any co-op points. With many teams with high-ranking scores on the field, this would be devastating to the losing alliance. The third option, a close, low-scoring match would be bad for both the winner and loser's rank, no matter where they were in the rankings. And the fourth option, finally, the outcome that all teams on blue agreed on would be best for both alliances. A huge loss. If one side scored in congruence with the average seeding points in the top eight, which was around 25 to 30 points at the time, and the other scored zero, both teams could obtain enough seeding points to stay in the top eight, with no one benefiting from the co-op score. The winning alliance would still come away with the, point, with the plus five bonus. The strategic thinking here was the difference between seeding both 111 and 1114 in the top eight, and seeing only one of them there. Next season, in 2011, and for much of the offseason in 2010, FRC returned to the win-loss tie system. Ranking score would continue to be prevalent in rankings, but much like 2009, it would be a second order sort versus the primary sort. It wouldn't be until 2012 that first departed from this method of ranking, and instead introduced a task on the field that affected rankings, with the co-op bridge. In addition, in the 2011 game manual, rules for blockading or colluding to shut down a portion of the game by using two or more robots became specifically called out as illegal. As Qual Match 100 played out, blocking two of the goals would be illegal in future years, even if it was your own. The FRC ranking system has evolved with the program. Seeding points may be a thing of the past, but the idea of cooperation has stayed with us. Although the 2010 system was still finding its footing, it did give us a great exhibition of scoring in Curie Match 100. The ranking system continues to change as the program changes, going from four ranking points to six in the last year. We'll see if this change becomes a mainstay, but until then, thanks for the rewind. Make sure you subscribe to the Fun Robotics Network on YouTube, and if you enjoyed the show, give it a like. Let us know your take on this fateful match in the comments, and we'll see you next time on Rewind. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Kettering University's cutting edge programs in their experiential co op model seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds, offering hands on, future focused learning that empowers students to pursue new ideas and inspires other institutions to follow their lead. Don't just be ahead of the curve, create the curve. Get more information at kettering.edu slash first. Andy Mark provides superior service with the reliability that teams expect. Check out their sport gearbox and ratchet sport options to their tried and true compliant wheels used by teams all over the world. From mechanical and electrical products to tools and hardware, head on over to andymark.com for your one-stop shop of high quality and affordable solutions.